I need you to stay with me now. Are you ready? We're about to get into something here that if you'll hang with me for the next few minutes, I'm going to make a bold claim. Are you ready? Here's the bold claim. What we're about to talk about today, if you will, if you'll lean in, has the potential to change every one of your relationships. Every one of our relationships. We're going to talk about one thing, one tangible thing that if you, partnering with the power of the Holy Spirit within you, it will have a power to radically transform every relationship you have. You say, okay, Josh, what is all this about? Well, before I tell you, let's just remember where we've come from so you'll understand where we're going. Because if you're a guest, if this is your first time, I want you to kind of get where we've been because this is going to hopefully make a lot of sense. So over the past few weeks, we have been talking about this idea of being resurrection people, resurrection people, becoming who God created each of us to be. See, we are born into a world that is broken. I don't have to convince you of that. And consequently, because it's broken, we are broken ourselves. We make bad choices. We hurt people. We hurt ourselves. And the world is just kind of falling apart. And so Jesus entered into this world of decay and said, I'm going to bring life out of the death. And so Ephesians chapter 2, we're told that it is by grace you and I, we have been saved That God, out of his love for us, brought us to life, and now he has given us a position of salvation, meaning you have been saved, you are positionally saved, and now he's in the process of helping us live saved. How many of us know that we all could do better at living saved, not just being saved? Anyone else in here wish that they lived as saved as they know they are I, I got to tell you, I find myself so often going, that is not me. This is me, but I'm living down here. And I want to talk to you this morning about what it looks like to live the way God has called you. Now, listen, if you're not a Christ follower, our heart, our hope is that you will meet Jesus today, that you'll say yes to him, that we can get you wet in the baptistry, that you'll go home restored and resurrected, okay? So cars on the table, we want that for you. But I want you to understand, even if you don't make that step today, I'm going, to, I'm going to just tease you with the idea that there is a way of living that God wants to give you if you'll say yes to him. So what is that? Okay, here's how I want us to start. Are you ready? Help me out with this phrase. If you know the phrase, walk with me through it. Say it out loud. You ready? <clears throat> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but you heard it too, huh? Words will never hurt me. Sounds great on a coffee mug. I just wish it worked in life, don't you? Now look, before we talk about our words, I I just got to do a little PSA, a little public service announcement here. We live in a culture that is easily offended, that seeks to be outraged over everything. And unfortunately, what is happening out there comes in here far too often. Can I get an oh yeah from anyone? So the church, I just want to be real clear here before we talk about our words. I got to say something to some of my more sensitive friends here today. Spiritual maturity is going from thin skin, easily offended, thin skin and a hard heart where God can't penetrate it. That's immaturity. But immaturity and going to become mature is going from thin skin and a hard heart to thick skin and a soft heart, meaning you are not easily offended by people, but you're convicted by God. Make sense? So we're going to walk through this today, and I want to talk to you very plainly because for some of us, we need to get a little tougher in our skin and a little softer in our words. So, you ready? See, we've been talking about what it means to be a resurrected person, and here's the big idea. Andy, put this up on screen for me. big idea is that God wants to save, wants to save every part of your life. From your nose to your toes, everything in between, God wants to save all of you. Salvation is not simply getting into heaven tomorrow, but living as though heaven has gotten into you today. Anyone? That's a quotable. You can go ahead and write that one down, okay? Living a resurrected life is not just for tomorrow. It's for today, family. And so God wants to fix the way you think, the way you feel, the way you believe, the way you act, the way you interact with people. In fact, we said week one that you are a collection of five dimensions. You have thoughts. You are a mind. You are emotions. You have a heart. You have a belief system, the core of who you are, your soul. You are a set of actions. What you do affects who you are. And you are the relationships around you, how you interact with others. And God's heart is to save all of you. So he said that God 
God wants to save your thought life because that'll impact your emotions and your belief systems. And then we have moved, starting last week, into that God wants to save your actions and your relationships. How many of us here would like God to work on our relationships? Anyone in here wish that we would have a better relationship group than we have today? And let me be clear. I'm not saying get an upgrade in your spouse. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying perhaps your spouse could get an upgrade in you that would then upgrade your marriage or your children or your relationships elsewhere and outside. And so here's the big idea. Here's the big idea. Today, we're just going to talk about what does it look like to be resurrected people with our words. And it's coming to one verse, one verse. If you will get this one verse, not just here, but here and here and all through your system, it will change everything because the Word of God is living and active. Okay? So if you will receive it, God will do something in your heart. And if you are not a Christ follower yet, that's okay. You can hear this. And, and even if you practice some of what we are talking about, I believe it'll change your lives. Before you get the full benefit, you're going to need some help. We'll get there later. Okay? So here we go. I want you to see this. Grab that little card on your seat. Go ahead and grab it. Little card on your seat. On the back of it is the verse for today. Why is it there? Because I want you to take it home with you. I want you to put it someplace where you'll remember it, memorize it, practice it, because we want to know the Word of God so it can change us from the inside out. Here's the, here is the verse. In fact, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Everyone, let's stand up real quick. Stand up. Come on, Christian calisthenics. Okay. I want to ask you to say these words with me out loud. We're going to read this out loud. And if you don't know how to read yet, just mumble, and we'll all think you're reading with us. Okay? So here we go. Here we go. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And the whole church said, grab a seat. Father, we need your words. Help us in Jesus. Amen. All right, let's walk through this. We don't have a lot of time, so we're going to move fast here. Notice this key word. He says, do not let any, what's that word? Talk to me, church. What's that word? Unwholesome. unwholesome. Now, this word unwholesome, uh, does that refer to vulgar words? Well, yeah, don't, 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 don't joke in coarse talk, of course. Does this refer to profanity? Well, yes, of course. Christ followers should not have salty language. And simply saying that's how you once were or where you work and all that doesn't jive because now God is in you and he now changes you. Uh, does it mean don't use God's name in vain? Absolutely. But the word has a, has a nuance to it that I think is very helpful. Notice this, unwholesome. You want to learn a Greek word this morning? Everybody say yes. yes. Okay, good. I'm glad. The Greek word for this is sapros. Everybody say sapros. 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 I love this word. This word, sapros. When you think of wholesome or unwholesome, I don't just want you to think bad words. Okay? Yeah, it would include bad words. But wholesome versus unwholesome has a deeper meaning. How many of us know that there are foods that you can eat that won't kill you immediately, but they're not good for you? You know what I'm talking about? I'm not saying don't just not drink arsenic, okay? Don't just avoid eating rat poison. This is the idea of saying Pick things that bring life. The word sapros literally means rotting or decay, rotting or decay. He's saying, don't let any rotten or decaying words come out of you. You say, well, of course, because if you have been raised from death and you are a living being, your breath ought to not be death breath. Okay. So here's what he is calling us into. He's saying... Your words should not simply not be bad, but they should bring life. Now, what I love is this word is used only one other place in the New Testament. It's uttered by a man. I think you may have heard of him. His name is Jesus. And he says to a group of people, he says, good trees, meaning people who've been changed from the inside out, good trees produce good fruit. But he then says, bad trees, sapros trees, Decaying, diseased trees produce bad fruit. Jesus is saying that what is going on in the inside comes out of us. This is why he says, out of the overflow of the heart, the 
mouth speaks. So Paul in this passage is saying, don't let any, don't let any diseased, decaying, rotting words just tumble from your mouth. If you can't keep the bad words from coming out, shut your mouth. By the way, here's a great phrase. In our house growing up, we were not allowed to say shut up. Anyone else have that rule? You're not allowed to say shut up? Anyone? Maybe? Okay. Well, so we got around it when we started learning Spanish. So we started using this other phrase. Evan, if you're with me this morning, you can correct me later. But the word that we would use instead was Sierra La Boca. Everybody say Sierra La Boca. It means shut your mouth. If you can't say a life-giving word, shut your mouth. Don't let any, any, any. That word any is so important, isn't it? He doesn't just say, don't let a few. He says, don't let any unwholesome talk. Nothing. Don't let it squeak out. Not just a little bit. Quick question. How much rat poison should you ingest for a healthy diet? How many unhealthy, unwholesome words should come from a healthy Christian? He says, now, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But, but, I love this. Only. Everybody say only. Only, this is so important, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Notice this, it's others, it's theirs, it's those. Who is the focus of every conversation you should have as a Christian? The other person. When you talk to someone, Paul is giving a radical reorientation. Our words are not for our benefit. I know we think they are, but they're not. They are for the benefit of those who listen. Meaning, you and I, by God, are to edit our words, custom craft our words, deliver our words for the one listening to our words. And this one thing will radically change everything. How many of our arguments would not even begin if we began with better words? How many of our relationships would not end if we began with better words? Paul wants to be very clear that a resurrected person will have, put this up on screen, a resurrected person will have resurrected words. Life-giving, satisfying words. Now you say, okay, Josh, that's great. How? I mean, can we just admit that that's the big question when we talk about these things? I doubt anyone in this room is sitting there going, nope, don't think so. Bad words, yes. Of course not. It's the question of how. So what I want to do is I want to take you down the road and I want to give you three things, three things from this scripture and one other that I believe will help us in living resurrected lives and resurrecting some... relationships, because I know in this room and online, some of us have relationships that desperately need life-giving words because they are on the brink, aren't they? There are marriages that today, if you would invest in good words, it would change everything. There are children right now hungry for parents who will speak vision and life into them, not simply correction, although correction is necessary. There are friends in here today who desperately need to know that they are not alone, they've not been abandoned. So if you and I will grab hold of this, it will change everything. And I want to show you how. But first, let me ask you a quick question. Um, I don't want to feel lonely up here, so raise your hand if this applies to you. Have you ever been in a car wreck? Any of you been in a car wreck before? Yeah. Okay, how many of you are, are, are comfortable enough in yourself? Like you're, you are secure in who you are enough to admit that at least one of those was your fault. Anyone else in here? Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. My first car wreck happened when I was 16 years old. And you want to hear how advanced I am? It happened in my parents' driveway. Yeah, I'm not making this up. Okay, 16 years old, mom and dad are going out on the town with our then preacher and his wife. They're going to a play, a show, something. They leave, they leave my preacher's truck Brand new Ford F-150, Hunter Green, super duper everything. It's not my fault that he parked it in a bad spot. He parked it directly behind me. I didn't see it. It's dark. It's Hunter Green. And so they leave. I get in the car. It's a white car. By the way, 
white really shows up badly on green. I get in the car. I'm going to go to see a movie with some friends. I put it in reverse. I go back. I begin to turn, and all of a sudden, I hear that sound. You know the sound that makes you want to throw up? And I'm like, oh, no. I get out. I look, and there on this beautiful hunter green truck is a white racing stripe. I was trying to enhance his vehicle. I call friends. I say, I can't make it. I got a problem. So for the next three hours, I am out there with a toothbrush trying to scrub out six feet of white on this hunter green truck. I got to tell you, I did a really good job too, except for the waffle design that was also in the truck. And I remember when Mike, that was our preacher, when he got back, I said, Mike, I got to tell you, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry, but I hit your truck. And the patience of Job was displayed on this man's face. He goes, what? I said, let me show you. So I show him. He looks, and, and a little part of his soul died right there. I saw it happen, tear down the eye. But here's my point. Sometimes we bump into people, and it's our fault. Don't mean to be, but it happens, right? So what do we do? What do we do? Some days we desperately need some roadside assistance. And so I'm going to give you triple A roadside assistance for your relationships. On that card that I gave you, on the other side, there's three A's. I want to give you three A's from Scripture that if you will push into these, it'll change everything. Let's go quick. Number one, the first A is attitude. When you have a moment of conflict or a moment to reconcile, whatever it is, you have to begin with the right attitude. Everybody say attitude. attitude. Let's do that again. Give me a little attitude with your attitude word. Ready? Attitude. There you go. I like it. Okay. Bring the right attitude though. See, it's not just bring an attitude. We're pretty good at that. Can I get an oh yeah? We're really good at bringing an attitude. The question is not an attitude, but is it the right attitude? And here's the question you have to ask according to scripture. Did you notice all of those words? Whatever is helpful building others up according to their needs that it may help or benefit those who listen. So here's the question. When you come, do I want to help this person? Before one word comes out of my mouth, the question on my heart must be, do I really want to help? Because if my purpose for engaging this person is anything less than helping them, then I need to Sierra La Boca. Shut my mouth. Because I've been resurrected by Jesus, and the words that are given to me must come out to resurrect others. The first question is attitude. Do I have the right attitude? John Maxwell, I think he does a great job of explaining this when he says, when it comes to people, Katrina, you've seen this, when it comes to people, we kind of put a number over someone's head, right? A one to a 10. So you look at someone, you'd be like, you know, Katrina, you're a 10, right? But then you see someone else, and you're like, mm-hmm, Todd, sort of a two today, right? Not really, bud. (laughs) But what you see or what you label someone, isn't it true that what you label someone is how you'll treat someone? Or to put it this way, what you see about someone is what you'll say about someone. And if I see you as a two, I'll treat you like a two. If I see you like an eight, I'll treat you like an eight. If I see you as a ten, don't you know I'm going to treat you like a ten? doesn't matter if you've earned it or not. How I see you is what I'll say to you and about you. In other words, before I come into a conversation, I have either won or lost that conversation based on my attitude, how I view you. So how do we view one another's? Consider others better than yourself, Scripture says. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. You are the image of God. Church, when you see another person, you do not simply see flesh and bones. You see the divine presence of God filling and indwelling this person. You say, well, what if someone's not saved? Do I still? Yes, because God created that person. That means my attitude can never be that you are less than a 10 because even if you don't live up to the number, it is my draw and my desire and my calling to treat you as Christ has called you. And if he is willing to die for you, I certainly can speak well to you. Amen? So it begins with the attitude. That's number one. Do I really want to help? Uh, A few questions to consider. Uh, Will this word benefit them or benefit me? Uh, Will this word help them move forward 
or keep them stuck? What's my attitude? Second thing, go with the right attitude and in the right atmosphere. Atmosphere. Atmosphere is what we live in and move in. The atmosphere is the space around us. When you come into a conversation, the second A is atmosphere. In other words, when you come into a conversation, you need to ask, is this the right time? Is this the right place? And listen up to this one. Is this the right person to talk to? Right place, right time, right person. Let's talk about this for a moment. Right time. How many of us would say that there is a good time and a bad time for people to come to you with a problem? Any of you have a good time and bad time? Let's do it this way. Where are my morning people this morning? Do I have any morning people here? You wake up, the birds don't just sing, they fly into your bedroom and make your bed for you. Anyone like that? Some of my morning people. My son is a morning person. He wakes up and he's just like, ah, oh. he's happy. And it can annoy people who are not morning people, right? Because my daughter, Emma, are you a morning person? No. No, no. Unless it's morning in a different country around the world. She is a night person. The party doesn't begin until 5, 6, 7, 10 o'clock at night. Any of my night people here, can I see some hands here? Oh, yeah. Can we just be honest that there is a better time and a worse time to talk to you? Don't come with a problem before 4 in the afternoon because you won't be awake. My wife, she's a morning person. I've learned if we have to talk through something, don't begin in the evening. That's not when she's at her best. I'm not at my best either. And I've just learned that talk to Lindsay, if I want her best, I've got to do it after she's gotten some rest, okay? Wait till she's had some rest, then talk to her. Same with me. You find the time that is best for the person you're talking to because it is about the other person. Remember, you're trying to win a person, not an argument. The second thing is place. How many of us know there's a good place and a bad place to have a conversation? Come on. How many of us know that there are certain places that you can talk and it's appropriate and other places it's not? If you're having a knockdown drag out with your spouse, and I hope it's respectful, but if you're having a moment of what we might call in the church intense fellowship, with your spouse, find the appropriate place to do that. If you have a concern with someone in the church, find the appropriate place to do that. If you have a problem with your boss or bosses, if you have a problem with your employees, don't tell them about your problem with them in front of everyone else. You find the right time and the right place. And then the third thing is the right person. Can, can we just talk real honestly for a moment here? If you're talking to the wrong person, the word the scriptures use for that is gossip. Please hear me. Nothing destroys a church quicker than someone who wants prayer requests from someone who doesn't need to know about the issue. You can call it prayer requests. Oh, I just, there's this issue. Would you pray for me? Or you can say, I just need advice, but you know the difference. And if you gossip... You are pouring out poison that will corrupt and hurt. It will create rot, not just in that relationship, but it will spill over and affect everyone else. Is this the right time, place, and person? See, you've got to come with the right attitude and the right atmosphere. And then number three, let's go quickly here. Number three is you go, actually, let's, let's put this up, sorry. Let's look here. Can we just be convicted for a moment here? What does Jesus say? He says, if your brother or sister sins... Go and point out their fault. Key phrase, though. Just say this with me. Between the two of you. Jesus doesn't give us an option to gossip, does he? He says, you go talk to the person. You talk to the person. Yeah, but they may not listen. You talk to the person. Yeah, but I'm nervous. You talk to the person. Yeah, but I might not know the exact right things to say. You talk to the person. You say, but I, I don't know how. Hang with me. I'm going to give you the how on one last thing here in a moment. So, attitude, atmosphere. And the third, final A, alternatives. Alternatives. Write down the word alternatives. What is an alternative? Well, an alternative is another way of doing things. In other words, if you come with a problem, bring a solution to the problem. Alternatives asks the question, am I offering solutions that we can try, keyword, 
together? Am I offering solutions, not just problems? See, a lot of us, and, and this is Josh, I prefer to offer problems than solutions. I'm really good at that. I've gotten great at finding the problems with all of you. And guess what? I know every Sunday you have certainly found all the flaws with me. Because you're like, whoa, that was a bad illustration. Well, he talked too long today. Actually, he talks too long every Sunday. Okay. Come with alternatives. We all know the difference between a critic and a coach, don't we? A critic tells you what you've done wrong. How many of you remember the Muppets? Any of you remember the Muppets here? Uh, A couple of old critics. Uh, Let's go a little younger here. Sean Alex, you gave me an illustration here. How about Ratatouille? How are my... Anyone know Ratatouille, the cartoon? Little rat? Squeakity squeak, squeak, squeakums. Anyone? All right. Do you remember the critic who was always upset about everything that was ever made? He would always tell you what was wrong with the meal, but never tell you how to fix it. We all know the difference between a critic and a coach. A critic says, this is what you've done wrong. A coach says, this is what you can do better. Boy, who doesn't need more coaches than critics in this world? People who just say, listen, yeah, that was a boneheaded decision, but let me show you. Don't do this. Do this. Here's the reality. You and I both want to do better, don't we? I mean, when we make mistakes, don't we want to improve? Great time to say yes. Yeah, say yes. Okay, good. So assume that that's what people want and give them the coaching, not simply the criticism. Because interestingly enough, a coach will make you better. A critic will often just make you bitter. Because it's never good enough. Resurrection people bring the right attitude in the right atmosphere and alternatives because they want, notice this, what's best for the one listening. Now, this is usually a time where we then say, so go with the right attitude, atmosphere, alternatives. Have a great week. And some of us just go, I can try, but it will be just like this last week. Like, how do we step from more information and strategy to actually doing it differently? There's a verse here I want you to see. There's a verse I want you to see. It's not going to be on screen, so listen very carefully. This is Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 30, it says this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were, key phrase, sealed for the day of redemption. You are sealed with the Spirit of God for the day of redemption. You say, what does that mean? Sean, Alex, come up here real quickly. Easton, can I get your help real fast here? Both of you guys, very quickly, come on up here. Come on up here. All right, Easton, I'm going to ask you to come stand right here, just right next to that blue line. Oh, that's fantastic. Come on up here. Sean, Alex, you're right here. Okay, very, very good. Now, here's, actually, come on over here. We'll do this. Now, here's the way things usually happen. By the way, everybody say, hi, Sean, Alex. (laughs) Say, hi. Uh, <laughs> Say hi, Easton. These are roommates, by the way. Do you think they ever argue? Okay, so we're going to move on from that question into how to fix it. Here's what typically happens in our relationships. There's an issue that's happened. Sean Alex hasn't washed the dishes. Easton has left his clothes on the floor. Something's going wrong. Who knows who cares? Usually what happens is this. Issue happens. One person looks at the other one. And begins to just go at them. I do the dishes. You do the dishes. I'm not surprised. So, (laughs) just pretend with me here, man. Okay, you're you're messing this up. Okay. So, they argue. They argue. And usually what happens is words come from one to the other. And you say afterwards, I wish there had been a filter between me and my words. Anyone else with me on that one? How many of us are like brilliant when it comes to our word management after the conversation? See, if if, if we were good at this in the moment, we wouldn't need the Spirit of God, would we? Oh, wait, is that the point? Hang with me. Did you notice the phrase? It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, grieving God Himself, breaking His heart with our words. You say, okay, I don't want to grieve Him, but how do I fix this? Notice the phrase. He says, with whom you were sealed. Sealed. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Okay, sealed, sealed. How many of us remember the days when you would actually write letters on a sheet of paper and put it in an envelope? Anyone remember those days? 
You take that little letter, you'd write something, you would send it to another person, but you would put it in the envelope, and the envelope would fully cover your words. And then it was sealed, it was held shut, correct? Before it got to the person? What if, what if standing between your words and the recipient was the Spirit of God? And he says, I tell you what, before you speak, you let me speak, and let's talk about this. You trust in God's presence. You allow the Spirit of God to envelop you, including your words, so that, so that when the moment comes that you're ready to let them fly, that you're ready to forget attitude, atmosphere, alternatives, I'm just going to give him a lot of attitude, that instead you go, okay, God, speak through me. God, speak through me. And here's the brilliant promise of Scripture, church, that when the Spirit of God is welcomed in, the sealing of God, He will envelop everything, including your words. And He goes, okay, okay, let's do this together. But before we unpack this and deliver it, let me do some work on you. I wonder what would it look like if we as a church began every conversation before a word came out of our mouths, the word on our hearts were simply this, God, speak through me. Would you say that with me? God, speak through me. Let's do this one more time. God, speak through me. What would happen if you allowed God to be the holy filter? What would happen if we actually believed God could do this? See, I I don't ask because I often don't think He will. But the most amazing thing happens When I have to step into a tough situation, either to apologize or to work through something or even say, you messed up, when I first say, God, speak through me, isn't it incredible that God actually will work through that moment? And He begins to work on me so that no matter how it's received, the words come with the right attitude. I want to do this to bless, not to curse, not to harm, and I come with alternatives because God is the one, hear me now, the one who can edit and deliver the right words to the person to bring about resurrection. Because God's heart is not simply to resurrect you, but to deliver His resurrection to other people as well. Have you asked God to help you? Before we do anything else this morning, we're going to take a moment to pray together. Because I sense even in this room, some of us need to say, God, just speak through me. I've got this thing going on. Speak through me. And so we're going to pray. Guys, you can go sit down. Thank you for your help. I'm going to ask you before we take communion, we're going to do this in a moment. Before we do this, I'm going to ask you, we just need to talk to God. We are told in Scripture that when you go before Father and you have not a communion wafer, but you're bringing an offering before God, and if you know of anyone who has anything against you, You lay your offering down there and you go and be reconciled to this person before you try to be reconciled to God. So we need to, this morning, I think, just pray to God and ask Him to help us in this. So will you just close your eyes, steady your heart, bow your head. Will you think of maybe a name of a person or a situation that you could use God speaking through today? Will you simply tell God the name of that person? Just you and Him. Let Him know what's going on and how you need His help. And then in the quietness of your heart, will you say, God, speak through me. Father, we need you to speak through us because when we do it on our own, we say things that cause damage. But for you to bring life in words, (laughs) you've been doing that since the beginning when you said, let there be light and your words brought goodness into this world. And so it is to you, Jesus, the Word that we come to and through to the Father And we ask you to be the word that we need to others. Holy Spirit, seal us so that what comes out of us is you 
And so that what comes into the lives of others is wholesome and helpful and healthy so that everyone around us may experience resurrection. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.